We want to continue with what we started this morning in identifying marks of the church, at least another installment in that general study. And we started this morning with the teaching of the Bible concerning how blood has always been involved in the redemptive plan of God for man. And we concluded, as did the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 9 and verse 22, apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. So nothing in the Bible is more clearly taught than what we just said. Blood is shed in the process of man's sins being remitted. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Seems good to continue with that line of thinking as we go down through the divine volume to see further what inspiration has said about that. The great messianic prophet Isaiah, living approximately 750 years before Jesus walked this earth, foresaw by inspiration mankind being healed by, if you please, the stripes of our Lord and the wounds inflicted upon him. In verses 5 and 6 of that wonderful chapter, Isaiah 53, the prophet wrote, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Continuing with Zechariah, he foresaw and, of course, prophesied that there would be a fountain opened for sin. And he wrote it this way. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For sin and for uncleanness, Zechariah 13, 1. And of course, over the years, we have participated in the singing of a song that is rooted in this verse. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Our Lord Himself coming near the end of his ministry, knowing full well how he would leave this life, instituted the Lord's Supper. Remember what we said this morning about the Passover, that God said, take the blood of those certain lambs and put it on the doorpost and mantle of your house. And when he came to destroy the firstborn of all that was in Egypt, when he saw the blood on those houses, he said, I will pass over you. And of course, Jesus and the apostles, being Jews and approaching God through the law of Moses, observed the Passover feast. And out of that type, Jesus instituted the supper of which we partake of in the Lord's assembly on the first day of the week. This is my blood, he said. He said, this is my blood of the covenant which is shed for many unto or for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. So when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, one of the things you notice is that one of the fundamental facts of it is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Also notice, as Paul the Apostle wrote to the church in Rome, that in uh, chapter 1 of that letter and verse number 5, relative to the vicarious suffering, and by vicarious we mean that he died on behalf of others, not anything he did that caused him to die because of anything he did. Notice, but God commendeth his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Concerning all of those who were not Jews, we read that Paul reminded those members of the church, Gentile members of the church, in the city of Ephesus in the letter 
bearing that name, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, saying unto them that they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel because God didn't allow the Jews to have fellowship with the Gentiles. He says of the commonwealth of Israel, and speaking of the Gentiles, they were strangers from the covenants of the promise. He says of them in that state, having no hope and without God in the world. He said they were afar off. But he said, then you're made near in the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13. Thus, that which saved the Jew who was faithful under the law, that would be the same as save the Gentile who never was under the law. We see also that the blood was shed. And this is just another way of saying it was shed for all, of every race and every creed every tongue and every color for every man on every shore and in every clime. Jesus tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> so if there's nothing else, that destroys the idea that Christ only died for a certain elect. The elect being those God predestined before the world to be saved, whether one to or not, and they couldn't get out of it. No, the Bible says Christ shed his blood. He died for all. Tasted death for every man. In John's revelation, we're told, speaking of the Christ, for thou wast slain and didst purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, Revelation 5 and verse 9. Now, who would that be? Well, in Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul said to the elders at Ephesus on Miletus that Christ purchased the church with his blood. So the church is composed of people all over the world, regardless of their ethnic background or color or the language they speak or their culture. Salvation through Christ because he died for all men. Peter declares that ye were redeemed with the blood of Christ. We read from 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, remember writing to Christians, not those outside the church. You know, we need to be reminded sometimes of who we are, what we are, and how it is that we stand before God as we do. Christians, children of God, ye were redeemed, not with corruptible things, with silver and gold, from your vain manner of life. He says, handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. Then again, the inspired apostle Paul states that we have redemption through his blood. I pause here to say more about redemption, though we've already used it. It's the idea that you're being bought back from something. Now, what could buy you back from being a slave to sin, sin that you chose to commit for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Romans 3, verse 23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Well, it can only be the shed blood of Christ. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So the sinless died for the sinner, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, Paul wrote, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of His grace. That means how rich His favor toward us has been. John's vision of the redeemed, of the church, of His children, of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven consisted of those who had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation seven fourteen. And, of course, we made reference to that passage even this morning in the lesson. Even though we closed out this morning with exactly how the blood's applied to a person so that person can be forgiven, we want to pose specifically the question, how are we cleansed by the blood? All these people out here are in sin who have not believed and obeyed the gospel. They are separated from God by their sins. There's no hope for them. They're outside of Christ. 
There's nothing but a fearful looking to of righteous indignation as God visits its vengeance upon them at the end of the world if they die in such a state. But all men who respect the Bible as God's infallible word do admit, do confess that we are saved by the blood of Christ. I do not know of anybody in what we commonly think of as the denominational churches that would not claim that. The controversy does not lie there. The fact that Christ shed his blood for all men, Hebrews 2.9, and that only the minority will be saved according to Christ in Matthew 7.13-14 through 14, is definite and certain proof that there is something for man to believe and do in order to obtain the forgiveness and blessings that's only afforded by the shed blood of Christ, the blood of our Savior. So the question ought to be among everybody that accepts the Bible as the true Word of God, telling us about the love of God and Christ's love for us and the sacrifice Christ made, the death of Christ, and the blood shed for the remission of our sins, Upon what conditions does the blood cleanse from sin? Do you realize how much work it takes in teaching the Bible to people, getting them to pay attention and be personally interested in it to ever get them to arrive at that question? Because they have no idea that there are conditions laid out in the New Testament of Christ that men must believe and that they must comply with in order to be saved by that blood other than just knowing the Bible teaches that he shed his blood for the remission of sins, and they will say, you have to ask Christ to come into your heart. So one of the great duties, as we as the church preach the gospel to every creature, study the Bible with people wherever it may be, where you can have a proper Bible study, is to get them to the point to understand they have conditions well, first of all, that there are conditions and that they have to meet those conditions in order to be saved by the blood that Christ shed for all men. In John chapter 19, verse 34, we learn that Jesus Christ shed his blood in his death. This being the case, and it is, man must come into Christ's death to, re, re, to reach the blood that was shed for the redemption of man's sins. Now, ask yourself the question, is that possible? Is it possible for a man 2,000 years removed from the historical uh, fact that one must come into the blood of Christ? Is it possible? Well, I'm glad to announce to you that it is possible. Paul has made that, I think, clear as to the entrance, the entrance, I say, into Christ's death, the place where our Lord shed his blood. Listen to him. Now, what's interesting, you're not going to hear something most of you haven't heard countless times. And yet Paul originally wrote this to the church who knew it and had to know it to become the church, a part of it, to be saved from their sins. So why does he write it to those who knew it, had to know it, believe it, and obey it to be saved. Because they need to be reminded as to what impact that should have upon their life and being dedicated to God and what it meant to live the Christian life. He simply said, Or are ye ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore with him through baptism buried or entered into his death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead of the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. Romans again, I say 6, 3, and 4. What is that telling us? Belief is absolutely important. <clears throat> Repentance is equally important. Confession of one's faith in Christ to be the Son of God is important. Indispensable. 
And yet the place where you contact the blood of Christ is in baptism. All the others are headed toward being forgiven of sins. They're indispensable. They're conditions that must be met on the part of the person lost in sin outside of Christ. The Word of God creates faith in the person, Romans 10, 17. It offers the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. That same word teaches there must be a dying to sin. That's repentance. Acts 17.30. It teaches plainly that one must confess with the mouth that Christ is the Son of God. Matthew 10.32. We must not forget that. But all that does is get you to a point to where you are qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ. Buried with Christ in baptism. Baptized into His death. Why? In His death He shed His blood. Now that's why when you read in Romans 6, 17 and 18, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form. Let that sink in. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Being then, when is the then when you obeyed the form? Being then made free from sin. When were you free from sin? When you obeyed the form? Not before you obeyed the form at repentance or confession of faith or belief. But what is the form that you obey? Because it's then that you're made free from sin and you become servants of righteousness. Only then. Not before, but then. When is the then? It's when you're baptized into the death of Christ. Why? Because it's a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Nobody can go back to the cross, stand beneath it, have the actual blood of Christ drip upon him. Nobody can go with the dead body of Christ into the tomb. Nobody can come forth with him on that resurrection morn. But you can obey a form of doctrine. You can obey it from the heart in full confidence that you're complying with the will of God. And you can be saved from your sins when you do. And so it is that one can enter the death of Christ by obeying a form of teaching the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ by being buried with the Lord in baptism, baptized into His death, and thus raised to walk in newness of life. So we marvel not that Jesus stipulated baptism as a condition of salvation in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And Peter said baptism was for the remission of sins. On the day the church started, Acts 2, verse 38. Then Ananias commanded Saul of Tarsus to be baptized and wash away his sins, Acts 22, 6, uh, 16. So in a study of the Bible, we're not surprised at such statements when we recall that the penitent believer is baptized into Christ's death. That's the place you know he shed his blood. And thereby, the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb is applied. No wonder then there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. In Acts 20 and verse 28, to which we referred earlier, we are told of the realm in which the blood cleanses. Now listen, people make light of the church. They don't think the church is connected with the salvation. They think it's something you just, after you're saved, however you think you're saved, that you decide to pick which church suits you. That's the whole denominational concept of the church. But you don't find that in the Bible. It's just not there. And we're not doing the world a service to minimize the teaching of our Lord on this. Take heed, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, first of all to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now the Lord's blood was shed to purchase the Lord's church. It's obvious then from reading Acts 2, the day the church started, that the Lord added the saved to the church. Which church is it? The one that He built, Matthew 16 18. It's the only church that contains the saved. When people say, Do you have to be a member of the church of Christ to be saved? 
Well, if I want to get a flippant answer, but a true answer, I say, I want to have them get there. Now, that's a strange thing to say. Why is that the case? Well, then we have to get on another subject. You've got to remain faithful all your life in the church. If you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, he never did say that the judgment to members of the church, well done, thou member of the church. He said, good and faithful servant. And uh, most of the New Testaments are written to Christians to try to keep them saved. That ought to say something to us, brethren. So it's an accepted fact that if a man is redeemed and purchased by the blood of Christ, it must be, it must be by virtue of the connection and relationship to the church that Christ purchased with his blood. That's why we're in this study, to try to give the New Testament of Christ and its identifying marks of the church that Jesus built and to which he added the saved, which tells us then the church started in Acts chapter 2 almost 2,000 years ago on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Do you have to be a member of the church to be saved? Folks, where does Christ put the saved? In a pump house? Where does he put it? In some sort of a religious institution man founded and governs with his own will. He put the, church, he put the people in his church. He knows their heart. He knows whether they have truly obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. So he, he alone adds to the church. Well, the church composes the family of God. You know, every one of us were added to our families. Every one of us. We didn't join our families. We were added to our families. Our parents added us to our families. So you think about that for a minute, and you'll see that even among the natural order of things, then the spiritual order of things regarding the children of God and God's family, all parallels. So all of Christ's blood went into the purchase of Christ's church. And that's further proof that I must be in that church to be a beneficiary of the shed blood of Christ. God added to the blood-bought church only those, I say again, who believed repented, confessed their faith in Christ, and were immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 37 through 47. Now, John has taught all of us how the blood may keep us clean. Now, for most of us in this room who are old enough to be Christians, we are Christians, and I'm concerned about remaining clean. Have you ever noticed physically how many things are out there to keep you clean? Why people make multiplied millions and millions of dollars on soap and soap products. Now, why do we have those things? Think of what's spent when it comes to hot water. Think of what's spent when it comes to bathtubs and cleansers of every description. But what about the cleansing of the soul, a non-material thing that will last forever and ever? So I'm told, as I quoted this morning, and it should be of great comfort to the member of the church, that if we as members of the church, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Now may I point this out? If we don't walk in the light as he is in the light, we can't have fellowship one with another because the faithful who are walking in the light cannot fellowship those who are not walking in the light. Now they can, but they must not. If they too want to step out of the light, they can what light is it? It's the light of the gospel. What light is it? The light of the authoritative word of my Savior Jesus Christ who shed his blood and purchased the church with his blood. It doesn't seem to concern people that much about fellowship. But it concerns the Bible and most of it's written to keep people in fellowship with God that they can be in fellowship with others who are in fellowship with God. So if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Again, I remind you, John was speaking to Christians, not those outside the church, members of the blood-bought church. So we need to bolster ourselves up as we urge the denominational people around about us and take all of what the Bible says on matters like this, that we can be sure we're faithful and not make light of it. Whoever has turned from the light of Christ's teaching has done this. 
He's counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10 verse 29. That spirit of God's favor, whereby he favors to save us when we don't deserve it and we can't merit it, is given only in the gospel of Christ. Only in the gospel of Christ. I pointed out some time ago in a writing I was having a bit of a discussion with that God's power to save is limited to the gospel of Christ. And the fellow went, wow. Tell me why that's so revolutionary. That God has located his power to save in the gospel message and nowhere else. And it declares that one must contact the shed blood of Christ which was shed for the remission of sins to be cleansed from sins and one must remain in contact with it. And listen. The blood of Christ flows in the body of Christ. Now, does your blood flow outside your body? I suggest if it's doing so right now, somebody call 911. But we don't seem to be that concerned at all if we say the blood of Christ is flowing outside the body of Christ. The Bible doesn't teach anything like that. That's what 1 John 1, 7 is saying to members of the church. If you're going to be faithful... You must do as the New Testament teaches Christians to do to be faithful. Thus, I bring this brief lesson on the blood of Christ to an end, admonishing every one of us, yours truly included, to be vigilant, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know our labor is not in vain, where? In the Lord. Why? Because all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. And when the Lord on the last day says to those on his right hand, representative of the saved, the sheep, if you please, well done, thou good and faithful servant, he will say it to them because they had continued in the light of Christ's truth regarding living the Christian life. And thus the blood cleanses them. And there will not be able, anyone able to stand up, including Satan himself, and point a finger at those on the right hand and say, You sin, because Christ can say, But they stand before me cleansed and justified and reconciled by the blood I shed for them on Calvary's cross. They are mine. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and they stand uncondemned. Now, brethren, who wouldn't want to be in that group? But it's going to take some serious thinking, planning, and acting here on earth so that the affairs of this present world will not keep us out of heaven. And above all, in the church, we ought to have in that great fellowship we speak of those things working to cause each one of us to help each other to remain in the straight and narrow way of truth, not deviating to the left hand or the right, a compromising God's will in any form or fashion. If you haven't become a Christian today, the truth of God's word on how to become one has been taught. If you're a child of God and you let sin enter your life, if you counted the blood of the covenant and unholy thing by your sin that you won't repent of, then we urge you. We beg you by the mercies of Christ seen in his death, Christ's death on the cross to repent of your sins, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the wonderful gospel message that saves us all, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.